Hello everyone and welcome back to this next lecture in the machine simulation series. And this is where we had left off last week where I was describing that the nature of the magnetic lines of force or the lines, magnetic lines of force are such that because the air gap in an induction motor presents the highest reluctance in the complete path of the magnetic lines of force as it completes its circuit. So for example, if you look at any given magnetic line of force, it will complete its circular path through three parts. That is the stator, which is a metallic medium, the air gap, the, the rotor, and again the stator and the metallic medium. So therefore, the air gap in this case presents the largest reluctance because the permeability of any metal such as laminated iron will be close to 1000 times the permeability of air. So therefore, quite obviously, the reluctance of this air gap is going to be significantly higher than the reluctance of either the stator or the rotor. And therefore, if we say that the reluctance of the air gap is the largest, then the magnetic line of force will try to find the path of least reluctance. Anything typically, whether it's current or it's water, will always try to flow through the path of least resistance. And similarly, the magnetic line of force will also try to pa pass through the path of least reluctance. And therefore, if you take, the look, take a look at the potential path of least reluctance, the path which is the minimum length will be the path of least reluctance reluctance. And because of that, majority of the magnetic lines of force that cross the air gap will cross along the radius, along all the radii. Right? If you look all around, the magnetic lines of force will be passing through this air gap from the stator to the rotor all around the air gap. And in all these cases, the path through the air gap with the least length and therefore the least reluctance will be along all the different radii. Right? Of course, there will be infinite number of these. Now, I drew just a few to describe this effect. And therefore, we had said that once you know the direction of the magnetic line of force, and if you assume any direction of current, so for example, if we say that this, the direction, the current flowing in the rotor were to be passing into the screen, so it's passing into the screen, then in that case, by using left hand thumb rule with the thumb, with the forefinger pointing in the direction of the magnetic field, the middle finger pointing in the direction of current, the outstretched thumb will point in the direction of mechanical force, right? Such that all three fingers have to be at 90 degrees to each other. Now, we also know that because this magnetic line of force is along the radii and the mechanical force produced is at 90 degrees to it, therefore, quite obviously, this mechanical force is along the tangent. And therefore, in the ideal case, the entire mechanical force produced will result in a rotational torque. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the non-ideality which can also result because of which there can be another type of force which could also result. So, before I start this lecture, a little bit of brief background that if you're interested in these kind of video lectures, but you would like something a little more comprehensive, I have full length online courses, which you can find on my own website, which is pythonpowerelectronics.com. So the name of the project is Python Power Electronics and pythonpowerelectronics.com is the homepage of this project, which contains all the information you need on this project. So on this homepage, you will find these four buttons out of which if you click on the button learn, it'll take you to the list of courses, which I have right now. So as of now, I have five courses and the very first course is called Simulating Power Electronic Circuits Using Python. And in this, I talk about the basics of how you can use Python and Python Power Electronics to simulate power electronic circuits. The second course I have is called Basics of Digital Signal Processing for Power Engineers. And in this, I talk about how you can use Python and packages such as the signal package within Python to design and analyze filters for power engineering applications. The third course is called Simulation of Magnetics for Power Electronics using Python. And in this, I talk about how you can use, how you can use Python and packages such as the Python Power Electronics, or actually you can use Python Power Electronics and Python to model and simulate magnetic components such as inductors, coupled inductors, and transformers for power engineering applications. 
The fourth course I have is called Control Analysis with Python for Grid Connection Converters. And in this I talk about how you can use Python packages such as Python Control along with Python Power Electronics to analyze and design controllers specifically for power engineering applications with the example of a single phase inverter connected to a single phase grid. And the last course is called Why Specialize in Power Electronics and this is a free motivational course targeted towards junior undergraduate students but also can be high school students who have not yet chosen their domain of specialization and this is to describe some of the challenges and power, uh, challenges and opportunities available in power electronics. So all these courses are available on two platforms which is Decibels Labs and Udemy and clicking on any of these links will take you to the course. The link for this page is provided in the description of this video. If you are interested, please do check it out. So with this, let me get back to my lecture. So as I already said that because of the nature of magnetic line of force to find the path of least reluctance, it most of the magnetic lines of force will flow along the radius while passing through the air gap, right? So this is only natural because it tries to find the path of least reluctance. However, we don't live in an ideal world and therefore it is only obvious that not all of them will behave nicely in such a manner. So for example, I'm going to just quickly delete some of these because I've described this concept. So let's just keep one of them. Actually, I'll just delete this as well. And instead, I'm going to draw a line indicating the radius. So this is the radius. I'm just extending it. So this is the radius which I'm extending and along this radius we had said that the magnetic lines of force will cross the air gap. So we are looking at this one specific case where the rotor conductor is at this, all the rotor bars are concentrated in this one slot and we are looking at the magnetic lines of force which are incident on this rotor conductor. So I had said that because the radius is the minimum length path across the air gap, the magnetic line of force will pass through this radius okay? because it is the path of least reluctance. But this is just the ideal case. In reality, you will see also something called as fringing. So when something passes, typically magnetic lines of force, you will see that even though everything is uniform, for example, I'm just going to draw some magnetic line of force, you would expect them all to be parallel lines. Right? This is just assuming that you have, actually let me draw it in another one. I'll delete it here. Delete it from here and I'll choose the other one here. And let me go over to this. So for example, if we have, quickly let me draw with my free hand. If we draw, I have a North Pole and a South Pole, right? This is North Pole, this is South Pole. So therefore, the ideal case would be that you would expect all the magnetic lines of force to go from the North Pole to the South Pole along parallel lines. Okay, this is what is called as a uniform magnetic field. This is the ideal case. And I'll just draw one more. This is the ideal case and of course you can just give them all even a little arrow here indicating that they're going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Right? Now, though this may be the ideal case, there will always be some amount of fringing. And fringing means that you would have, typically, let me say usually, most fringing occurs at the tips. So at the tips, you will see a lot of magnetic lines of force, which will actually choose a path such as this. And also there will be some kind of non-linearity throughout. So not all the lines of force will choose the path, which is the min minimum length path. Even though a straight line between these two is the length, which is minimum and therefore the path of least reluctance. But even despite this, because the world we live in is not perfectly ideal, you will have all these other magnetic lines of force, which will choose all these different paths that are not necessarily paths of least reluctance. 
Now it's important to note that this is a very small phenomena and detecting this and also computing this is very complex, right? All we can say is assumption without specialized tools, we can assume that maybe around 1% of the magnetic, magnetic lines of force will behave in such a manner, right? Will behave in a manner in which it chooses a path which is not the path of least reluctance and therefore it chooses this path which are called fringing, right? These are paths which are usually called fringe effects and other forms of non-linearity. Honestly, even I don't know that much because this is not my specialization, right? But what's important to understand is if we go back to our other diagram, it is therefore we can apply the same concept here. We can say that there will be some magnetic lines of force which are not along the radii but are still incident on this rotor bar, right? So let me draw one here. We can also draw one here. And these are merely represented. Doesn't like to go all the way here. So I'll just stop it here because it tries to join it. But these are two magnetic lines of force which are going through the, which are going past the air gap but and are incident on this rotor conductor but are not along the radii. Right? Quite obviously this is not the radii, radius. This is not along the radius. Right? This is along some other line altogether. If you extend this line, it is not the radius at all. So therefore this path is going to be much longer than the path of the radius and therefore this is not the path of least reluctance. Now, this is again a very small fraction which behaves like this. So, around 1%, that's, about, that's probably how much we're talking, maybe 2%. Again, it's a very small fraction but it exists. Now, in such a case, if we apply Fleming's left hand rule again and if we point our forefinger in the direction of the magnetic field, we point the middle finger inside the screen because that's the direction of current that we have chosen. Then in that case, the outstretched thumb will once again indicate the direction of mechanical force. So direction of mechanical force is in this direction, but specifically, it will be perpendicular to this magnetic line of force. So therefore, if I try to draw it, it's going to be somewhere along this direction. It is no longer the same magnetic line of force which is along the tangent. It is not the same, right? So now the question arises, what do we do with this? We have this, let me just draw an arrow here because it is after all a mechanical force. It is a vector. So let's just be clear and there's also, I don't want to start drawing because it's doing some other kind of weird stuff. It is joining all lines together. But these are also vectors. So they essentially have arrows and this one as well has an arrow. These are all going into the radius that is coming from outside towards inside. Now, if I take this mechanical force, this, this mechanical force which is produced because of this flux and here it will produce another force which is, again also I can draw, this is along this direction. So again, I can give it an arrow. This is the new mechanical force. So these two non-linear or rather non-ideal magnetic line of force, which are not along the radius, will result in mechanical forces which are not along the tangent. All right. So again, we can of course say that there is some angle between this flux and this Again, I just can't draw, but you have to assume it's joining all of them together, it's a mess. But if we choose, if we say that there is an angle here, right, between this line, which is not along the radius and the radius, and let's say we call that phi, right, then in that case, the same angle will be between the, the new mechanical force and the mechanical force that lies along the tangent, right? So there is this angle phi. So, if I try to draw it here, let me just draw it separately here. So, let's say I have the tangent and let's say I draw a tangent here, not the best diagram, actually let me delete this. And let me use this straight line. 
So this is the tangent. And if I take this mechanical force here, which is at some angle phi, let's say this angle is phi, then quite obviously we can therefore resolve it into two components. We can resolve it into a component along the tangent. So therefore there will be a there will be something here. Let me just draw this arrow here. Again, it's doing weird stuff. It is joining things together. So again, you have to assume, let me just draw this here. There will be a projection here. So if I draw a projection here, oh my God, mess. Okay, I just can't seem to draw with this thing. I'm still not used to it. It is joining it here. Okay, let's just think. Assume that this is a 90 degrees. This is wrong. This is confusing, so I just delete it. I can't seem to draw, sorry, but this is it. You have to use your imagination. If I want to take the projection of this vector along the tangent, then it's quite obviously going to be the vector multiplied by cos phi. And at the same time, I can also say that there is another component which is perpendicular to the tangent or which is along the radius, right? So I can here, hopefully I can draw some arrow. Oh my God. Okay, I just can't seem to draw an arrow. Okay, that looks like an arrow. It's good enough. So there are these two components, one force which lies along the tangent and another component of the force which lies along perpendicular to the tangent or along the radius, right? So you can do this, imagine this here as well. This force, which is produced by this magnetic line of force, which is not along the radius, will now produce two components of force. One component of force along the tangent, another component of force along the radius. The component of force along the tangent is the usual component of force which results in rotation because it produces a rotational torque. But this other component of force which lies along the radius doesn't really produce a rotational torque. Why? Because it is along the radius. So what does it do? It produces vibrations. Because of all these nonlinearities, the components of force that lie along the radius now result in vibrations of this rotor. The rotor not only rotates, it vibrates. Correct? And any motor is going to face these kind of vibrations because you always have these kind of non-idealities. Non like I said, around 1-2% to of the magnetic line of force will not behave nicely. Therefore, they will not follow the ideal case of flowing through the path of least reluctance. And because of this non-ideality, you will result in components of force along the radius. So this component of force flows al is uh, towards the radius. And for this other non-ideality, non it is away from the radius. Right? Now you might think to yourself they cancel each other, but that's not necessarily the case because non-idealities do not behave nicely. You can't say that this magnetic line of force will have the same strength as this magnetic line of force and therefore they cancel each other. There's no guarantee. For all you know, they may not be this magnetic line of force at all. Right? So they may not, uh, sorry, this magnetic line of force because of which they may not be this mechanical line of force. It is all possible because non-idealities are difficult to predict. They behave very differently. They behave chaotically. So because of these non-idealities, non which is around 1-2%, to 2 you now have vibrations. Right? So the interaction between the external magnetic field or rather the magnetic field produced by the stator and the current flowing in the rotor bars, which is also produced because of the magnetic field produced by the stator inducing a current in the rotor, the interaction between these two results in a rotational, rotational torque as well as vibrations. Correct? And any motor will therefore face these kind of vibrations. So, now this is again very very difficult to calculate because it is very difficult to determine what kind of non-idealities non exist in such a magnetic machine. It is very difficult. To be able to solve this, you need very advanced software that performs very different types of calculations. You might need to use finite element methods. You might need to use newton raphson methods. Honestly, even I don't know all that, right? Because this is not my line of specialization. 
what I do know is these non-idealities will exist and they result in a vibration of the motor. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you all this is because in a vast number of cases, most of us don't really learn the concept of rotation and the concept of torque produced in this manner from basic physics. So basic physics describes the nature of mechanical force produced, the ability of the force to produce a torque, as well as the ability of certain forces to produce vibrations along with, along with torque. So this describes all that happens in a machine. This is how torque is produced. This is how vibrations are produced, which is what's going to happen in any motor. You can design a motor as well as you want. You can never completely avoid non-idealities. So therefore, not only will it rotate, it will also vibrate. So with this, I'm going to bring this lecture to an end. The main concept behind this lecture, as I said, was to describe visually and from first person principles using basic physics, how a mechanical force results in a rotational torque. Going further in the next lecture, I will describe how we could potentially write an equation for the torque using this, but in reality, we will never, never use this method to calculate the electrical torque produced. And I will also describe that probably, if not in the next lecture, in the next few lectures. So, as before, if you have any doubts, please do post either in the comments or email me or message me on social media, whichever is your preference. Otherwise, I will see you next week where we will continue with this and describe how a mechanical force produced can be used to calculate the electrical torque produced and also possibly how why this method is not used in reality. Thank you so much for listening and goodbye for now.